Hello everyone and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk, Warehouse Management, Module Implementation, Best Practices. My name is Evan and I'll be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this web conference through Teams Live events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. Today's web conference is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation and by participating in the session using Microsoft Teams, your name, email address, phone number, and or title may be viewable by other session participants. If you do not consent to being a part of a recorded session, please disconnect at this time. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions throughout and at the end of the event. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Now let's get started. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Aaron Merch, Senior R&D Solution Architect. Zach Greenvoss, Principal R&D Solution Architect, and Nicole Gump, Senior Program Manager. Aaron, over to you. Great, thanks Evan. Hi everyone. Yes, as Evan mentioned, my name is Aaron Merch. I'm a, a Solution Architect on the Fast Track team um, at Microsoft for Dynamics 365 Finance and Operations. I have some colleagues joining me as well, Zach and Nicole. Um, they'll be helping answer questions behind the scenes. Um, uh, throughout the presentation for me and hopefully we might have a, a little extra time at the end to answer any questions that you might have as well. So from an agenda perspective, what we want to get covered here today um, is going over a few tips and tricks, do's and don'ts um, around the implementation of the warehouse and transportation management modules in Dynamics 365 for supply chain management or finance and operations. Uh, review testing best practices related to the modules, uh, discuss additional considerations for large and complex implementations, and as I mentioned, hopefully have a little extra time at the end for uh, question and answers as well. All right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and just jump right in here. So related to implementation best practices, um, I have a few slides on um, some configurations and usability related to the uh, warehouse and transportation management modules. Um, first point I want to make here as it relates to usability within the application is I say um, based off of feedback that we've gotten from customers in the past, um, we do recommend that you try to minimize the number of different warehouses you set up at a physical site. So it's not uncommon for us to see customers that you know have seven, eight, nine different warehouses for a physical location or a physical site. You know, pretty soon you have quality control warehouses, raw material warehouses, production warehouses, finished goods warehouses, bulk storage warehouses, et cetera. And what that ends up leading to from a, a usability perspective is um, these handheld device users then have to try to maintain or remember exactly where they're at in a warehouse, log out of one warehouse, log into another, remember that they're in the right warehouse before they start transactions, et cetera. Pretty soon you're having to log in and out of multiple warehouses just to move product from one area of the warehouse to another. Um, so what I say is, um, or what we what we recommend here is that you try to minimize that as much as possible. You know, from a usability perspective and user perspective on a mobile device, it's easiest to just you know log into a single warehouse, stay there, and then also longer term that also cuts down on the amount of configuration and maintenance that you need to do within the application as well, right? So. Um, instead of having to set up all of, a lot of these different, you know, uh, wave templates or, or location directives or, you know, any number of things um, from a, a system configuration perspective, you just have to set that up for a single warehouse that's already shared out. And then also if you're shipping out of, you know, a single warehouse that makes those uh, transportation module management module setups uh, a lot easier as well. You're not having to set up a bunch of those route plans or route guides uh, for multiple different warehouses as well then. Uh, second point that I wanted to make is uh, do try to minimize the number of mobile device menu items as well, or at least take into consideration what the warehouse workers are going to see um, and try to minimize that potential for error. So that's kind of goes back to the first point, right? Is if your warehouse workers are having to remember to log in and out of multiple different warehouses throughout the day, or even just to complete a single transaction, it makes the overall user experience, you know, a lot more cumbersome and prone to error in the system. So what I always say is, you know, you know, try to try to take that, keep that end user focus in mind as you're building out your menu items 
or your menu, yeah, your main menu items or your mobile device menu options um, for those users um, so that um, um, so that they don't have to, um, you know, from a usability perspective, um, they don't have to remember it's not cumbersome. They don't have to click through a bunch of different screens to try to get to where they're trying to go. Um, a lot of times this try, kind of grows organically as throughout the implementation process itself, you know, so you have requirements pretty soon you have menu items for each of your different requirements and pretty soon you have hundreds of different menu options for these users. So it's always best to try to minimize that as much as possible, set it up, make it intuitive and friendly for those users um, that are going to be using the mobile devices. Next thing I want to talk about is wave processing. Um, first point here is do try to utilize min max replenishment in conjunction with demand replenishments to improve those wave processing times. So we have uh, multiple different options as it relates to replenishment templates. So we have min maxes. We also have like a order and load, uh, I believe are the two other ones off the top of my head. Um, so when you set up those demand based replenishments, what ends up happening is as part of the wave processing itself, um, what the system is going to do is um, go try to allocate those goods. Then it's going to also create those re that replenishment work at the re at the same time that it's um, executing that and, and building out that replenishment work behind the scenes in, from a system perspective. And what that does is just increases overall load on that wave processing overall in the system, right? So so what we recommend that you do is try to set up your min max replenishments as well because those actually run as a separate batch job so it's not it's it's outside of that standard way processing behind the scenes um, so what you can do then is, is segregate that work run it as a batch job and then your way processing times would be uh, much more streamlined at, in those examples um, so what we recommend is um, if you do set up min max um, fulfillment levels in a warehouse, let's say your pick faces, you have bulk storage areas and then you have pick faces and you need to move product from bulk storage into where um, um, orders are actually going to get picked for fulfillment. Um, what you do is you'd set up these uh, batch jobs to run, um, you know, again, depending on the flow of the work in the warehouse, you know, um, you know, maybe a handful of times, two, three, four times a day, we'd set up these min maxes. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that we now have a replenish to max feature as well. So what you can do is um, as as work as minimums are hit when we're running these jobs, we can turn on that replenish to max. And what's going to happen is that we'll get work created for for uh, these warehouse warehouse personnel to go take uh, product out of these bulk storage areas and fill up those pick faces to the maximum um, for order fulfillment. Uh, next thing as it relates to wave processing is do try to utilize the multiple wave processing tasks to improve that wave per processing performance times. So there is a tech talk with additional details on this. Again, uh, this is newer functionality. I would say within the last you know 18 months or so, uh, we now do have the ability to um, handle multiple wave processing uh, threads simultaneously. So um, what this would allow you to do is instead of having a long sequential uh, wave processing, we can actually break that up into smaller chunks and run multiple at a time and they'll just decrease overall wave processing times. Um, and this becomes important when you're dealing with, uh, you know, those large scale implementations, you know, hundreds of thousands of orders that you're having to uh, release out to the warehouse to get work created for uh, simultaneously. Next thing I want to talk about is from a performance perspective. Um, you know, it, it was not uncommon uh, historically when folks were first starting to learn this module and um, uh, figure out how it worked is that, um, you know, they turn on all of this historical, all of this logging within the parameters uh, without understanding or realizing that there's actually cleanup jobs that also have to be set up to uh, clear out those logs periodically. So what was happening is that we'd be seeing customers that, you know, they're all of their uh, warehouse management log tables are some of the largest in the database, you know, so gigabytes worth of historical work creation history um, sitting in a database and causing performance issues over time. So if you are, if you do enable any of that logging in the system, um, 
also recommend that you do uh, enable these uh, cleanup jobs within the module as well to make sure that you're purging out that information uh, on a periodic basis so those tables are not growing exponentially. And as it relates to that topic, um, um, one of the things that I rec that we recommend here is that um, don't leave those history logs enabled unnecessarily in the production environment, right? So from a from a system perspective, those log tables are meant for troubleshooting purposes, right? So as you're configuring the system, uh, getting things enabled, etc., checking to see if everything is working as expected, if you're running into any errors that you need to go back through and try to troubleshoot as to why things are not working correctly, um, you know, you can reference those logs. But once you get things set up and, and working in the system, at that point in time, you know, it's negligible whether you would actually need to keep any of that history or those creation logs at that point in time. So, so really um, only leave those enabled if there's a, a true purpose for what you're doing with those logs um, in those production environments. Next thing we want to discuss is the uh, new deferred put framework, or again, newer deferred put framework. It's been out for, um, well, some transactions have been available for close to a year now at this point in time, I want to say. Um, so we have in the past seen customers have performance issues on those handheld devices with large number of transaction records that need to be processed. So uh, examples that I've seen is if uh, batch or serial tracking is enabled, or also if you have a lot of items on a, let's say a single container that you're moving from a packing station to an outbound dock, et cetera. You know, anything that where we'd have to queue up a lot of uh, warehouse inventory transaction records that had, need to post um, simultaneously in the system. So there, there is a throughput rate for uh, processing those transactions in the system. And so without the deferred put framework, the user experience on the handheld devices is that they need to, on the handheld, they would hit done or go or execute on whatever they're trying to do. And then you'd, they'd have to wait for all of those inventory transaction uh, records to get posted into the database uh, before they could move on and start doing their next task within, within the warehouse. And this could take several minutes, depending on the amount of unique inventory transaction Posts that need to be that need to be um, made. Um, this could take minutes, you know, to several minutes. And so, what the deferred put framework does is it actually um, allows these processes to get queued up into the deferred put framework, and then they'll be executed behind the scenes. So, what it'll do is it'll free up the handheld devices much quicker. So that the end user, all they have to do is hit done or end or execute on their handheld device, and it's just going to write that into a, into that queue and it's gonna free up that handheld device much more quickly for them. And then behind the scenes, the system can catch up and post all of those inventory transaction records over the next several minutes, but they, the warehouse worker can continue on to the next step or the next stage or the next thing that they needed to do in the warehouse itself. Uh, currently supported transactions for this is a put to staging or an outbound dock. Um, also support inbound put operations and then uh, inventory movements are coming um, fall uh, later this year, this fall. Again, with disclaimer, you know that's our that's our that's the current plan or approach, and that is subject to change until it's actually available. But that's the the the, the rough timeline of when we're expecting the inventory movements um, functionality to be available as well. Uh, final thing as it relates to the um, just configuration and usability is I say do join the um, the Yammer group that's out there for the WMS, TMS, WHS um, modules within the application. So this, this Yammer group has been out there for uh, several years now. It's a great source of information for um, customers, partners, such as yourselves um, to, um, to post questions, get answers, review historical questions that are out there. We also have a, a bunch of our, our, our folks from the product team are out on this as well, answering questions. Um, and we're also posting out announcements for, um, let's say, a newsletter that we're posting out gets posted to the site. And then also if we have any upcoming workshops, um, we're posting that as well out, all out on this Yammer group. So if you have not yet joined it, um, um, I will be sharing out this deck. You'll have access to it at the end of this once it gets posted up onto the Tech Talk site. Um, so you can just follow that link there. Um, 
and and that will get you that Yammer group and you can go ahead and get signed up. OK, so the next thing I wanted to talk about here today is around testing strategies. So for those of you not familiar with the fast track team and and uh, our role at Microsoft is we we help we assist customers in their implementation of Dynamics 365. So we have various different teams across our Dynamics 365 product offerings. And one of the main things that we're working with customers is around um, testing of the system and preparing for go live um, for our customers that we're helping support. Um, so a lot of the things that we're talking about on a day-to-day -day basis is with our customers around testing strategies and, and how best to test systems and ensure that they are ready for go live. Testing can get broken down into kind of these main buckets here that I'll be talking through. Um, and then we'll be spending additional time on each of these different types of testing and what it is and best practices uh, specifically around the warehouse and transportation management areas of the implementation. All right, so the first set of tests testing that is typically happening on an implementation project is you, what we call unit testing. So this would be testing of specific requirements. So as part of the beginning of the project, you're typically working, if you're a partner, you're working with your customers, or if you are the customer, you're working with your end users or the users of the application, and you're gathering all of the information, you know, what is everything that the system needs to do uh, for our company, right? Or what does everything the system need to do for my customer if you're a partner? Um, and so what you'll do is you'll gather all of those different requirements, and then um, you'll want to go ahead and disposition those requirements as a fit or a gap, and then you would test those out, right? So if it's a fit, then you just go ahead and configure the system, and then you test out and ensure that that requirement works, right? So it's single function, typically a single function within an overall workflow. Um, and then it's also important to consider any type of edge cases or any unexpected input as well, right? So don't just focus on what the system needs to do. Also consider what the system needs to do if something goes wrong as part of this. If somebody hits the wrong button or enters the wrong information, et cetera, or what sort of error messages do we need to receive as part of these processes as well. So just make sure you keep that in mind. In order to help facilitate this unit testing within the application, there's a few different tools we make available for Microsoft. Uh, first is Azure DevOps. So if you're um, familiar you know, with the Dynamics 365 implementations, um, what's going to happen is that's going to link to an LCS site or a Lifecycle Services site behind the scenes. And then you also have the ability to then to link your Azure DevOps um, to, to your LCS environments, et cetera. So, so you can um, do your integrations with your business process models, with your business process libraries. Um, you can also do your task recordings and create task recordings and task guides within the D365 uh, application. And then you can also set up test suites for uh, tracking of those unit testing within Azure DevOps as well. And these are all gonna synchronize and integrate um, between your Dynamics 365, your LCS and Azure DevOps. So that's our, a great tool out of the box that helps um, keep track of where you're at from a total number of unit tests that need to be run, as well as progress for each of those different tests that have been run in the system. The other thing that's available, um, let's say, as I mentioned, you have requirements, you could have fits or gaps. Um, if you do have some of those gap requirements and you're extending, writing extensions or customizing the solution, um, another great tool that uh, developers or technical folks can um, focus on as well is we do make available all of our standard Microsoft acceptance test libraries. So these are essentially the uh, set of steps or this set of tests that um, can be automatically run um, within um, Visual Studio uh, against you know, all of our predefined um, tests from a Microsoft perspective. So as you're developing new functionality, you can run it against our standard ATL libraries um, to ensure that your code doesn't break any of our standard functionality out of the box, et cetera. Um, there is a tech talk available on this. So if you are uh, more on the technical side and you want to get additional information, there is a tech talk out there as well um, from last year where we talk about these acceptance test libraries and what, what they're useful for. Specifically for the warehouse or transportation management modules, um, as it relates to unit testing, 
Um, there are still two different options out there for you uh, from a handheld device perspective. Um, you know, we have the application, the app or the mobile app that can be installed on Android or Windows based devices. So on laptops, um, handheld scanners, Android phones, et cetera, you can install the, the app. And then you also have what I call the emulator, which is that web browser. So there's a specific URL that you can type into your D365 environment, and then it would access, and you would access the mobile device menu options uh, via a web browser. Um, so there are two different options available. I just make sure I call it the point here is that even though the menu items themselves are going to be the same against across the, both of the options here, um, there is slight variations to the processing of how, how things are, are handled behind the scenes technically. And so it's always best to make sure that if you're planning on using the mobile app, um, it's it, while it might be nice to use the emulator during testing to set up on, let's say, like your super users or your consultant laptops versus having to install the app everywhere and try to keep it up to date. Uh, while it might be a, a quick fix for that, um, there are differences. So make sure that you are doing any, if you're especially if you're customizing anything, make sure that um, you're doing your final testing within the app itself. Don't just rely on the emulator as far for all your testing before go live and then go live with the app because you might uh, run into some errors there. Next, next in the hierarchy of testing. So once you get through individual requirements testing, then you'd move into what we call process testing. So that would be an end-to-end -end flow. So let's say from a unit test perspective, we might have a requirement that uh, requirement is that ability to add a customer to a sales order, right, is our requirement. The next step up in the chain is a process testing, and, and that would be the entire order management um, business process flow, right? Can we get orders into the system um, from adding customers, adding items, getting pricing, setting delivery dates, et cetera, everything that you know needs to go into creating an order into the system. We always recommend from a Microsoft perspective that this is done on a tier two plus environment. Um, there's additional details on um, these testing approaches in the additional tech talks, but just be aware that tier two plus environments are those environments where we have our application components separate from the, the SQL server components. And so um, this would basically be, you know, any of those sandbox environments, Microsoft managed sandbox environments that are available in your in as part of your uh, subscription that you have, right? That we always recommend that the process testing be run there versus our what we call tier one are those developer boxes where all every all application and SQL components reside on a single box. Uh, again, there's slight differences technically, so you want to make sure that you're doing any of this uh, elevated type testing on these tier two environments because that's what we consider to be production like environments where those uh, components are separated out. And the other thing to keep in mind then with process testing is that you utilize real data. So, so always start your data migration activities early in the process of the project, right? Um, as soon as as soon as you gather requirements and you move into the configuration phase, make sure that you're also simultaneously working on getting your data cleaned up and ready um, because you don't have until your go live date to get your data ready, right? You want to, what you want to be have happening is that you're testing those data and you're having multiple runs of testing your data throughout the implementation life cycle, right? So as you're moving through each of your different testing phases that you have you know, you have another round of data, you can cleanse, you can figure out what's wrong with the data, if you need to make any changes, et cetera, that you can be doing that throughout your testing cycles as well uh, versus waiting till the end. Next, in the hierarchy of testing, so once we get through a single requirement and then we get into our process testing, once we get past a single business process, we get into systems or integrations testing, as we call it. So this would be a stringing, you know, end to end uh, uh, processes together in the system. So not only again, just to further elaborate on my example I've been using of order management. Um, now we would go from order management all the way to collecting payment from customers, right? So we'd be entering orders into the system. We would do be executing pick pack ship operations in the warehouse. We'd then be doing accounts receivable and collecting customer payments, right? So the complete process, making sure that works. 
And as part of that complete process, we might have additional integrations or ISVs in play as well. And it's at this point in time that we want to make sure that we have all of our application components in place and we're testing everything simultaneously. Um, so making sure at this point in time, this is where we're typically branching out from our core product team. It's not just our consultants, our power users. We're also starting to then get our uh, end users, starting to get to possibly some end user involvement as well, or branching out that product or the implementation team as well at this point in time. And then just a final note, as we as I mentioned, um, ADO is the acronym for Azure DevOps, right? So just making sure that we're setting up our test plans and we can set up scenarios for testing of these of, of, of this uh, systems or integration testing and track that within Azure DevOps and track overall progress as well. So again, just circling back to that same Azure DevOps tool, uh, great for monitoring and reporting on overall testing of the application or the system. Um, next topic that I want to talk about here um, and what we'll be spending a lot of time on today um, or getting a additional detail as it relates to the warehouse and transportation management modules is around the performance testing of the environment. So this is a required step before you go live on the system, right? So don't just stop at ensuring that, you know, if, if, if you have requirements for the ability to enter sales orders into the system, um, don't just stop at you know, if, if you get one sales order entered into the system, don't just stop there, right? Now we need to check for performance and load on the system. So this is where it becomes very important that you go out and gather, you know, uh, transaction volume estimates, and then uh, you run that through the system and we try to scale that. We, we test the system at scale before you go live as well to ensure that we're not gonna have any performance issues when you go live. Right, so in, in as an example, you know, if, if, if the customer is processing, you know, let's say 5,000 sales orders a day, how best can we automate that process of entering 5,000 sales orders in on any given day and processing through those through the system and ensure that all of our various integrations, customizations, as well as the standard product offering will scale up for that sort of volume that we're pushing through the system. Um, and again, there's additional tech talks on this on this topic, so I won't go into full details on what performance testing is and how best to execute that. Um, again, just go out to the tech talk site, and there's um, some there's a series of of tech talks on performance and planning for it and how best uh, to execute that. Uh, but just keep in mind, you know, start early in the process. Uh, that's that's probably the biggest takeaway from the recommendations that we make from a Microsoft perspective related to performance testing is, you know, start early, give yourself time to tune. You know, performance testing tends to be an iterative process, um, you know, where if you're not hitting, you set up your benchmarks, if the system's not hitting those benchmarks in terms of timeframes for, from a performance perspective, go back through, find what's taking the longest, fix that, move on to the next thing, move on to the next, next, next. Um, so just make sure you start early so that you have time to make those changes and you don't have to, you know, the, the worst case scenario is that you wait like a week before go live and then you start running some performance testing. And now if, you, if you're not hitting your performance benchmarks, you know, now you're basically looking at a delayed go live uh, because of it. So make sure that you give yourself plenty of time that you can address issues should, they, should you find any. Um, so from a standard system perspective, um, we do have some automated tools to help in that. Um, we have our Perf SDK, our Performance SDK, um, that we can actually script out. So what you can do is go through and uh, do your task recordings within the application and save those as, um, as a basically developer version that can be imported into Visual Studio and you can automate them. So you can scale out and simulate user load in the system. So that, that's a great tool for um, expanding out saying uh, what what is, what does sales order entry from a performance perspective look like for one user? Then we go to five, 10, 100, 1,000, you know, depending on the size or the complexity of your implementation, you can scale those out and we can simulate that. And then we can go back and look at how the system is responding to that sort of load. So those are all great tools uh, using those task recorder and, and automating that. Um, you know, again, I mentioned the Perf SDK, that's the Microsoft tool. Otherwise, there's uh, there's a bunch of other third-party tools out there as well that we've seen our customers use. Um, 
and and they all it's all great and um basically what from a fast track perspective our only re recommendation is that you know you find a tool use it and make sure that you have confidence in the solution before you expect to go live as it relates to WMS performance testing, um, some of those tools are not going to be available to us, right? So we're not going to be able to necessarily go out and re do our task recordings and make those available um, to be scripted and automated um, at user load. So we do have to do things a little more manual from a warehousing perspective. And so this typically means that we identify a, a set of users that we're going to target to help us in testing the solution before go live. And um, how to set up this performance testing from a warehouse management perspective is, is basically what we're going to be walking through here next. But what you need to do is identify your scenarios that you want to performance test from a warehousing perspective, determine those user roles within the warehouse, document those expected transactions and load rates. Um, we need to generate our data so that it's available for our users. And there's a couple of different tools available there, um, a data management framework, which if we wanted to import data, or we also have the data expansion tool within the application itself that would go ahead and, and let us set up, you know, you know, those mass numbers of sales orders. Let's say if we're going to want to test our uh, pick, pack, ship operations, we could go in and within the data expansion tool, go out and create like 500 sales orders within the application if we wanted. And then the final step would be to actually execute those tests. So we'll take a look at each of these steps individually here next. So first step, as I mentioned, is determining those scenarios. So what's your peak load scenarios? Um, you know, here's an example of a customer. They said peak, what they would expect to be their peak volume at time frame would be if something were to happen and the system goes down and there's, let's say, a critical integration goes down that they can't no longer receive orders for let's say 30 minutes. So what would that look like in order to try to get caught back up? You know, so that was the scenario they identified. Um, this could be any number of things. You could do more of like a day-to-day -day basis. Let's say that most of the orders come in between noon and one and we have a thousand sales orders come in during that time frame, and that all need to get picked, packed and shipped, et cetera. Whatever it is, just make sure that you define those scenarios and then next, for each of those different scenarios, that's where those transaction volume estimates become important, right? So for each of those different, for that scenario, you need to determine each of those different user roles to fulfill that scenario, and then the transaction rate at which it must be completed in, right? So, so in, in this scenario, it's actually a system goes down and it's uh, a receiving process that they're scripting for here, right? So based off of our transaction volume, is, volume estimates. Here's all of the different individuals within the warehouse that are going to be involved in this scenario in order to get it executed. And based off of our transaction volume estimates, this is the rate at which they need to execute their job. Right, so it becomes very specific, very data driven for um, the scenario as well as each of those different roles and the, the, the rate at which uh, all of those operations need to be completed in. So at that point in time, you basically have your benchmarks, right? So this is from a performance system performance perspective, this is the throughput at which we need to be able to execute using Dynamics 365 in our warehouse, right? So, so once you have all of those roles and those benchmark transaction times, um, the next thing you're gonna do is create instructions for each of those different roles. So again, this would be more or less your task guide or your task recording. Um, in a warehouse mobile app environment. So what are those specific steps? This is part end user training, part scripting of the scenario. So making sure that everyone that is going to be involved as part of this testing uh, knows exactly what they need to do. And then the final step here is from a preparation perspective would be that we have unprocessed work available for each of those different users. So again, in my example, if it's a thousand sales orders in an hour, what we need to do is make sure that we have a thousand sales orders available, right? So either again, as I mentioned, you can either import that in. If you have integrations, you can run it through your integration easy enough. Um, or we also have that data expansion tool as well um, for you if you need. So at this point in time, um, you basically have everything you would need. Um, typically, this is off hours time, you know, so outside of the day to day operations of the warehouse. 
um, that this is typically getting run. However, if, if you have availability or if you have a slow season or something like that where you have uh, workers available as part during the day, then you could certainly run it then. Um, uh, it, I don't know if I go as far as to say it's a best practice, but it definitely helps to have like a, a war room type environment or uh, where a consolidated area where everyone that is going to be executing the test can be located uh, somewhat near each other. Or um, I've also seen this work well across teams, you know, where where I've had customers that have, you know, multiple warehouses all doing this kind of simultaneously and they're checking warehouse uh, processing times uh, across all of their different warehouses and sites. And, you know, they'll just basically set up teams calls and, and make sure that everybody is has the ability to communicate. You have your IT folks checking uh you know, monitoring servers and um, and and that sort of thing, as well as handheld device performance, and then you're getting feedback real time from all of the users as well. It works well. Um, here, it it also shows if 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 it's helpful for the individuals, you can also set up these stations, and you can help them conceptualize exactly what they're doing in the scenario, what their role is, and. You know, even though you're sitting at this table over here, just envision that you're in this area of the warehouse and this is what you're doing. This is your role in this test, right? And so then it's just running the test at that point in time, right? So that's where you bring in your users. You'd have your bench. So we have our benchmark times based off our scenarios. We know exactly where we need to be when in this process. And then we, it just flows through um, you know each of the different roles right and so you can say grab your first set of 10 orders get that process through the system and and work that through and based off of our benchmark times we know roughly where we need to be and when right and so you'd script out as part of preparing for your actual stress test make sure that you have those benchmark times identified and those are your your um, like i said those are your benchmark times and then you would be recording actual times against those right and at the end of this exercise, you'd basically be able to go back and look at your environment monitoring, make sure that your servers were able to hold up appropriately, make sure that your handheld devices were able to keep up, make sure that your wireless access points in your warehouse were able to keep up, et cetera, right? We're testing all of that simultaneously. And if we don't hit benchmarks, then we need to go back through and analyze, you know, what broke down in the process. And if we're not hitting benchmarks, you know, how critical is that to our goal live? Would that be considered are we seeing like go live blocker type issues as part of this testing or not? Um, and then also, do we need to go back through? If, is it is it customizations holding us up, et cetera? Do we need to redesign something that we put together here in order to make sure that we hit our benchmarks? Um, so that's everything related to the performance testing um, with the handheld within the warehouse itself. The next thing, once you get through all of that, once you start hitting your benchmarks, you're comfortable. We no longer, you know, the business signs off essentially on the solution at that point in time saying that we are able to execute as a business. Um, you know, this new system is not going to, per we have no issues with going live with the new system. There's nothing preventing us from being able to go live with the new system in Dynamics 365. It's at that point in time then that you would be requesting out that production environment. You're now ready for go live. Um, so you'd go out, go ahead and request that production environment and what you get back from Microsoft is a blank production environment, right? So you need to do all of those steps of our activities to prepare that production environment to get it ready for go live. And so from a fast track perspective, what we recommend is that you actually execute a mock go live at that point in time. So this is essentially a dry run of preparing that production environment. It allows everyone that's going to be involved in preparing that environment uh, a practice round of making sure that they know exactly what they need to do, right? So moving configurations from, let's say, if we have a, a gold configuration environment, move that up to our production environment, running our data migrations, going through repointing if we have any integrations or certification, you know, cert certificate, um, updates that we need to make, et cetera, that we have kind of all of that documented. And this goes into what we call a cutover plan. So basically what you do is you'd have your cutover plan, all of those steps are activities that need to be run. You'd execute all of those, get a good test. You also have the ability to run a day in a life test. So we're previously, we're looking at like max performance or load on the system. A day in the life actually tries to sequence it out via like a real world or a real life example of 
you know, at 6 a.m. we're doing this, at 7 a.m. we're doing this, at 8 a.m. we're doing this, et cetera. We kind of flow through and we it's basically a day in the life. Like imagine that this is the day we're actually going live in the system. Let's work through these set of activities in the system, make sure everything is still working as expected in this production environment. And then finally, you can also do any final performance validations of that production environment. You know, so so a lot of the times, typically what you're doing is you're running those performance tests in a uh, tier two plus environment, right? And you're getting those final performance metrics. What you want might want to do then as well is make sure that you rerun some of those final performance tests in that production environment. Make sure you're seeing the same results in that production environment as you saw in those in those uh, final performance test environments. And this is also uh, then a, a good point as well as, you know, again, this can be throughout the implementation, but for sure you definitely want to do this before you go live, which is, you know, get out there, make sure that everything you're doing is not in that conference room or in that set of, you know, uh, fold up tables as you saw in that example, right? Make sure that you're getting out on the production floor, seeing how the warehouse operates, making sure you understand how the production floor operates, et cetera. Um, you know, do that final double check of everything in the system, right? Making sure that all your location labels have been applied as expected, that, you know, double check inventory counts in the system, make sure that those aren't way off. You know, make sure that um, if, if you're moving to pallet labels or license plate labels, box labels, et cetera, if they haven't done that in the past and they're doing it now, making sure that all of those got applied as expected. And then finally, also just you know, double check of the of the devices themselves, right? Do we have wireless coverage? Are the handhelds working as expected? Also, etc. So you know, so it's just that final double check. Make sure you're doing. Uh, don't make any assumptions before go live. I've I've, I've just seen, you know, throughout I, I, you know, it's almost every go live. There's something that happens out on that warehouse floor that where there is an assumption made. Um, and, and now you have to account for it at, after go live and it just slows things down and makes things that much more difficult uh, at, at the time of go live. And so that was everything basically to get us up to the go live, right? So at this point in time, um, we've gone through, we've done all of our testing, done our performance testing, we requested the production environment, we've prepared that, everything is still on track, we go live. Now you need to shift your focus to regression testing, right? It's at this point in time, you know, we're in the continuous update mode of Dynamics 365, right? So near monthly updates to the system and any one, any only one version is only going to be supported for, um, you know, let's say a two to three month time period. So we need to uh, keep in mind that we're going to have this, this um, continuous cycle of updates to the software that we need to account for, and then we need to set up uh, testing plans for as well. And this is what we call regression testing, right? So does the new ver application version break anything that we had previously that was already working? So that's regression testing. Um, so since this is such a continuous activity, now in the Dynamics 365 world, is you wanna try to reduce those manual testing efforts as much as possible. Um, so one way that you can do that, the Microsoft tool that we make available for you is the RSAT tool or regression, regression suite automation tool. Um, this allows you to go through, take those task recordings that you're making within the application of executing a recording specific um, processes or steps within the application to do, you know, to, to execute uh, business operations. Um, what you can do is you can then take those recordings and bring them into the RSAT tool and we can basically it's it's like a, a version of like robotic process automation where we're going to go through and we're going to automate you know, you know those set of activities and then as a, we're going to give you a pass fail result of that activity right so just a single user you know here's I was able to enter sales orders without issue on version application version 12 can I also now enter sales orders in application version 13 uh, next month as well, right? So we can take that's we can script out and record those set of activities and drop it into the RSAT tool and it can automate that for us. So again, there's tech talks on this with additional details of how you set it up, um, but just know that it is an automated tool. Um, and again, up to probably 12 to 18 months ago, um, we actually didn't have support for the warehouse mobile app in the RSAT tool. Um, 
thanks to the work that Zach has done though, we have now made a warehouse app task validation tool available for that warehouse regression testing as well. So now you can actually execute complete business process flows end to end um, with those warehousing app steps involved as well. So you can go from entering orders to picking, packing, shipping, to invoicing customers, to receiving payment, et cetera. You can automate that entire process flow and, and run that uh, automatically and you can get pass fail results. So it just streamlines that regression testing on a monthly basis for you. And so uh, you can see here, there's a link for that warehouse app task validation tool as well. There's a link, there was a, a tech talk that Zach hosted on that as well. If you need additional information, how to set that up and how that works. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to go over from a testing perspective. Uh, final topic that I wanted to cover here for today's call was all around uh, additional uh, considerations as it relates to what we call complex implementations. So this would this would typically be, you know, a multi-site, multi-warehouse, large kind of global coverage with warehouses that have, you know, um, labor planning involved as well as like a completely dedicated individuals that are basically at 100% capacity, right? So, so the we have labor force um, is based off of uh, expected demand in that warehouse and they are 100% utilized and, you know, there's not a lot of downtime. We don't have a lot of standing around, etc. Um, so I'm just going to run through a, a set of additional kind of considerations that we need to take into play um, for those types of large complex type implementations of the warehouse management module. Um, first thing is, is um, you know, from a fast track perspective, one of the first things that we're looking at is a risk of a project, right? Like how risky is this project and are there ways that we can help reduce risk? You know, so this might include, you know, could we start with a, a few smaller warehouses to start with? have them go live, make sure everything is working as expected, try to iron out some of the, the bugs or some of the things that were not considered before go live, get those all taken care of upfront before we start bringing on the entire company. You know, is that possible versus a big bang, which would mean, you know, all warehouses, all users simultaneously going live. Um, uh, next thing, or we could take a look at maybe a subset of business processes. Maybe we just go live with warehousing operations, not production or transportation or vice versa. You know, can we layer in the processes that we're turning on? Or is there, finally, is there any sort of business seasonality um, that we need to take into account? Is there a busy season and a slow season? And can we go live, you know, at the beginning of slow season to make sure that we get everything ironed out um, before we really start hitting the system hard during our busy season? And from a risk perspective, just keep this in mind um, as it relates to warehouse management implementations um, is that things start to fail or that there's problems with the implementation, things were not thought through all the way or tested completely before you go live. Um, you know, that has huge impacts to the business operations when things start to go badly. Um, one of the things that I, I make sure that people are aware of is that these issues always will tend to snowball on you, right? So if, if you only get 80% of your orders out today, you're gonna need to get 100% of your orders out tomorrow, plus the other 20% that you didn't get out the day before, right? So now you're, now you, not only do you have a new system that you might be having issues with, but now you have 120%, now you have additional, now all those benchmarks and those timings that you thought you needed from a system processing perspective, all go out the window because now things need to, you need to speed up, right? You need to try to catch back up. And if, again, if you go two days in a row with only hitting 80%, now that third day is an almost insurmountable amount of work that you need to get out the warehouse. So, so just keep that in mind. Make sure that as part of your testing that you truly are ready for go live, um, because if you're not, you're gonna see a lot of issues very quickly and it's gonna have large impacts. And then keep in mind that there might not always be a quick or easy answer to the problem, right? It could take weeks or months um, you know, to determine a solution to some of these things. So it's something that you have to live with. So just make sure that um, you're doing your testing and um, you're, you're prepared for a go live. Uh, next one that I say here is a, a common mistake that we'll see with our partners is that they tend to focus on the software too much as part of these large complex implementations. Right? It's not just enough 
to know Dynamics 365 for a lot of these implementations. Um, you know, as, as we mentioned, we mentioned the requirements, we can gather benchmarks, et cetera, but, you know, you, to a certain extent, you also need to be bringing experience and knowledge of the industry and the warehouse and common warehousing um, to these implementations as well, right? Um, because you don't necessarily know what you've designed is going to hold up, right? So you can test everything, but there might be surprises for you once you actually go live. So one of the examples I have is like uh, an implementation we saw where a customer has a lot of new products on an annual break basis. So they're getting a lot of new products into the system. And what got missed is, um, you know, they have bulk storage areas and they had pick faces and they had pick faces set up for all of this product, but they had missed um, during the requirements gathering the that at the point at some point in time they're actually going to have to clear out some of this old product to make room for the new product so that it could get you know brought over to your pick face your pick locations again and so since they missed that step what they had is they had all of this old product taking up all of their pick faces and as new product was coming in the door and that's the hottest and latest thing with the highest volume um, you know, they had nowhere to put that product. There was no, there was no physical space for this product to go in these pick locations. So then pretty soon now you have all of your warehouse workers are having to go into these bulk storage areas, cut open boxes, start picking directly from the boxes because there's nowhere on your shelves to put it. So it's just things like that where you might want an, an, just like, uh, an outside, um, it either could be an outside consultant or just making sure um, like a, someone that's not involved in the day to day of the project, just making sure that you've thought through all of the ramifications of the design decisions that you've made and ensuring that you haven't forgotten anything as part of the setup of the system. Next topic here is um, exception management. So just making sure that you don't just train your the warehouse workers on the happy path, you know, like here's A to B, you know, first I pick it, then I pack it, then I put it on the truck and I ship it and everything goes out and then we post packing slip and everything's done, right? Um, you know, make sure you figure out what you're gonna do for uh, exceptions management as well, right? Let's say that uh, I go to pick 10 of an item and there's only nine on the shelf. What is that user gonna do? What, what happens then? Or let's say that truck gets a mile down the road. We've already posted everything into the system. We've created our packing slips, et cetera. Truck gets a mile down the road and we figure out that it's overweight and now it has to come back and we have to start unloading things. How, what are we gonna do in that situation, right? So, so just make sure that you think through, this is kind of get back to that negative test cases uh, from that unit testing setups that we talked about at the beginning, right? Like, what happens if something breaks? What are we going to do? So just keep that in mind uh, as part of the testing and the exception management process. And that's just from a business process of exceptions. Um, but there, you know, we have run across, um, you know, historically it happened more frequently. Now we're getting a lot more better at this, detecting these, but, you know, you can get even data inconsistencies within the application itself. So what are we going to do when these situations happen? Make sure we have a plan in place. And I'm going to have a slide further on that introduce the concept of an order hospital, uh, which might help in the processing of these uh, these trouble situations or these exceptions based processing. Uh, next topic here also is then just making sure that we have an increased focus on the reporting of these warehouses. So from a flow management perspective, um, for these complex warehouses, you know you're dealing with multiple orders consistently throughout the day at given times. And that warehouse needs to make sure that um, if there's a 10 a.m. shipment that it's getting out the door on time, because again, it's gonna be that snowball effect of if the first truck doesn't get out on time, pretty soon everything else for the rest of that day starts getting further and further behind. So uh, a lot of these complex type implementations is that there's reporting requirements and those warehouse managers need to know exactly where they're at at any given time throughout the day. So just making sure um, that we have reporting available for them um, so that they can make sure that their warehouse is running optimally. And that's both from like, let's say from a outbound, like it might be from a processing perspective, it also might be from a labor planning perspective as well. And what I say here is a good starting point is typically setting up those data entities um, to get your work line details out to reporting systems. So that allows you to look at historical information as well as lets you plan for upcoming or future um, work that needs to be executed as well. 
And finally, final point here is uh, do conduct time studies as well. Um, so, so I mentioned this as part of that process testing, right? So identify scenarios, identify roles, figure out your timings on each of these different processes. Make sure you know what those baselines are uh, before you go live in the system. So record what you need the system to be able to execute in and then track within Dynamics 365 how long it's going to actually take you. You know, uh, a lot of times if you're coming from an unsophisticated warehouse, let's say it was paper based and they didn't have to scan anything and uh, inventory control was a second thought. Now all of a sudden where you're having to scan every transaction in the system, it might end up taking a little longer in, in Dynamics 365. And that's not just an application issue, that's just uh, you know, a fact of if you're introducing this additional step in the process, it is going to take users a little longer. So make sure you understand how much longer that's going to take so that you can extrapolate out those results and make sure that you're doing proper labor planning around that. You know, as I mentioned, a comp in a complex warehouse, they might be 100% utilized in their labor force. So if you're adding an extra 10% time to each pick in the warehouse, extrapolate that out. What does that mean from a labor planning perspective? Do we need to have additional, do we need to hire additional people? How else could we redesign the process so that we can hit our target times with the labor force that we have, etc. And so the final big bullet point that I put here then is because again, um, you know, seeing this with customers, we get pulled into a lot of the escalation type issues is that this just wasn't thought through before go live. And now we're back to that, you know, snowball effect of, you know, we've added these extra steps. It takes workers longer to do their job. Now all of a sudden we're not getting all of our orders out of the day, um, et cetera, or we're missing our cutoff time windows for trucks leaving the warehouse, et cetera. So make sure, don't wait until you go live to find out all of these issues are gonna start popping up at go live, right? Make sure that you're out there, you know exactly how long it's gonna take. You know that you're, and you're confident that the system's gonna be able to keep up with the with the business and you're not gonna have these operational type issues after go live. So um, from, a, from an overall implementation perspective, um, again, this is actually an external consultant that we've worked with in the past that kind of put this together based off of some of the, the work that he'd done on some of the our troubled implementations that we were getting pulled into. And this was the things that he basically brought to the table and said that this is what he most saw missing in our troubled implementations, right? Is that customers were not accurately or, or setting setting aside enough time for new SKU setups. So if you're in an industry or a customer that has a lot of new products, making sure that you, again, conduct time studies, figure out how long it takes to set up a new item and that you're staffed adequately for that. Uh, labor management reporting was missing, that flow management, so making sure that you have the right labor uh, at the right place in the warehouse to make sure that everything is getting out the door on time. And then also this concept of what we call this order hospital, which is also um, kind of what I touched on previously around that exceptions management or what do you do when things go wrong? Uh, that's basically what the order hospital concept is of all about there. And so you really need to just industrialize all of those warehousing type operations in the warehouse um, by doing this. And so I'm going to go through a few. I'm going to spend just like one slide on each of those different four uh, topics here. So flow control from a reporting perspective. Um, you know, that might look differently for different industries. So in this example, this might be like a, I think this is a retail example here, right? So you have your daily schedule for this by store. So you know exactly from a retail perspective, here's the trucks that are going out for the day. This is where they're going. This is when they need to leave the warehouse. Based off of that schedule of these different trucks that might be leaving throughout the day, now we're setting up our schedule over on the right hand side. And that's our schedule for hourly processes and where we need to be, right? So this would be that warehouse manager. You know, are we on track? At any point in time during the day, they can go look and see, am I on track? Am I ahead or behind of where I need to be to make sure that everything's getting out of my warehouse on time today? Again, this would be another example of a flow management report then, right? So based off of my pick zones, I have my target. So I have my benchmarks. I know of roughly how many license plates I can pick in an hour. I know based off of the total number of picks out there, I know by zone. Uh, what every what everything uh, needs to get done on any given day, and then I can see, you know, am I over or under, and where do I need to deploy my workforce within my warehouse to make sure that things are going to get uh, out the door on time. You know, if I have a lot of zone C picks versus you know zone A picks, I don't have any. You know, I don't want somebody standing around in zone A doing nothing, right? I want to take that person 
bring them out of zone A, put them into zone C so that I have additional pickers uh, to help keep that um, on time and on track. We also have uh, new tools available coming um, this fall timeframe. So starting in 10.013, there is a flighted feature for a workload visualiz visualization tool. Um, so if you if if in your test environments, if you don't have 10.013 installed yet, I encourage you to do so. And I, I just dropped the uh, flight name there for you as well. So it's in it's in preview mode right now, but you can feel free to get that set up and then um, and, and, and play with this new tool that's uh, available for you as well. And then the other thing I mentioned is uh, labor management reports. Um, so this would be, again, this would be historical. This would be an example of a historical labor management report. You know, how efficient have my pickers been within the warehouse over the X given period of time? I can look at their utilization and their, and their uh, well, utilization really, on, and how, how well they've been doing over the last X period of time in this type of report. So that's historical reporting on labor. And then we also have the ability then, again, based if we get those work line details out of the system, we then have the ability to do our, our future as well, right? So based off of the number of orders in the system and the uh, open work that's out there, this is how many, this is how many, uh, how much work is gonna be out there in the warehouse. Do I have enough employees uh, scheduled for these given days to make sure that I get all of this out the door on time? And then that final concept that I brought up is that order hospital, right? So this would be, um, in short, again, I'm cutting close on time here. So basically, in short, it, it dedicates resources to fixing problems in the warehouse. So instead of having to train all warehouse workers how to do all of those, you know, exception management type processes, you know, I mentioned the I go to pick face and I'm supposed to pick 10 and there's only nine there. Well, now what do I do, right? Do a, how do we train that user? You know, here are the eight steps on the handheld device that you need to do in order to to keep moving on with your day or to go try to find this product, etc. Um, you know, what the order hospital does is basically like if you run into any sort of issue at all as part of your day-to-day -day activities, you know, just go dump it in the order hospital. We have we have resources, we have workers that that's all they do is help fix problems, right? Okay, there was supposed to be ten. There's only nine. Okay, so I know we have nine of them. Now I need to go find another one. It says that there's some in the bulk area. So I'm going to go pull some from the bulk area. I'm going to grab one more, complete this order, and then I'm also going to fill that pick face because uh, there's an inventory discrepancy in the system. So these would be like your management type people or supervisor type folks uh, within the warehouse that are just helping keeping the rest of the warehouse on time and on track because once you start running into those issues, now we're back to that same problem where if you're not hitting benchmarks, things are starting to snowball on you. Um, so just making sure that you free up your normal day to day workers, make sure that they're getting your orders out on benchmark time so that everything else is staying on track. And then we're also dealing with these problem orders as they come up as well then. So I was hopeful that we maybe have some additional time for questions. Unfortunately, I think I've run long on my presentation part of this again. So hopefully um, Zach and Nicole were able to help get your questions answered. If not, um, here's my contact information. So here's my email address. If you have anything else or any questions or concerns or issues, feel free to reach out to me. Um, other than that, I think we're all set. So back over to you, Evan. Awesome, thank you, Aaron. We would like to get your feedback on today's session. I've posted a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel. We value your feedback and welcome your input on how we did today and what you would like to see in future sessions. The survey score is on a scale of one to five with five being the highest score possible and we thank you for your participation in that. Again, as a reminder, the recording of today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter, Aaron, and a thank you to our audience for logging in and joining us today. Please stay safe and have a great rest of your day or evening wherever you are. Goodbye.